Esteban, Steve Ryan. All right, well then I'm gonna go ahead and, 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 and welcome you all to uh, our Wine Foundry Wednesday and uh, welcome to the Wine Foundry in Napa Valley, California. We are a, a small family owned winery focusing on making uh, custom wines for collectors as well as small uh, high-end brands. Um, if you are new to checking us out, we also have two brands of our own. If you ever want to see the quality of wines that we produce, uh, you can go to anarchistwineco.com and check out the Anarchist Wine Co. lineup or the sister brand, Foundry Wines. Um, tonight, we've got uh, a very special program for you. Uh, we've, I think, titled it Raisin to Harvest. And um, we've got Stuart Ake, my trusty reporter with the uh, white earrings over there, hanging out in the Oak Knoll district of Napa Valley. And he's with some very good friends of ours at the winery. And, um, and we're gonna be introducing a, a new vineyard to our lineup here. Um, we've got Steve and Betsy Moulds, and they uh, own Moulds Family Vineyard. And they're going to kind of share a, a, a lot with us tonight about their property. They have a, a very, very special property and I'd actually, on a personal note, like to say that their daughter Hayden, who is a, a good friend of, of both Stu and myself, um, Stu and Hayden actually hired me for my first role in the wine industry um, as their intern. And so, um, it, which worked out well <laughs> for me, at least, because um, I'm no longer an intern. But uh, <laughs> Hayden's a very good friend. She works at Three Sticks Wines over in Sonoma and, um, and has been there for a number of years now. Um, and so uh, we, Steve and Betsy are, are extended family to the Wine Foundry and this year we actually have the opportunity to work with uh, some Cabernet Sauvignon clone 169 from their property. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to give a, a real brief introduction. This is Steve and Betsy Moulds. I'm going to let Stu kind of take the lead on the more interviewing bits here. Um, but uh, you know, this is kind of the, the quiet before the harvest storm. And uh, it was really a lot of fun to be out in, in some vineyards with Stu today. Um, it's always such a, a calming, great, fun experience and, and to taste the berries sweetening up and Barajan's complete and things are happening and, and the energy's starting to, starting to go. It's actually, you know, it's, it's the best I've felt since probably March 14th or 15th, I think. <laughs> um, but uh, but without, without further ado, Stu, I'd go ahead and, uh, and, and hand it off to you. You hey, thank you so much. Yeah. So I am so excited to have Betsy and Steve Moulds. Uh, and we, I am perched uh, overlooking the vineyards and overlooking Napa Valley. We are in the Oak Knoll District. And uh, Betsy, Steve, thank you for joining us tonight. Hey, before we kind of, we'll, we'll kind of show some photos and share some stories of the property. Um, but you've got a very unique, uh, very unique property, very unique vineyard. What what was the mission? Uh, you grow Cab Sauv, Cabernet Franc. What was the mission for the property? And and what what does Mold's Family Vineyard say in the bottle? <laughs> <laughs> the million dollar question. I, I think that over the twenty years that we've uh, been doing this. Um, We've learned a lot about um, what viticulture is all about. We went back to school, um, Betsy and I, when we moved here, went back to school to get a degree in viticulture and enology. Um, and being associated with the Napa Valley grape growers has given us the opportunity to really learn a lot from very talented people who are growers all over the valley. And we've learned to appreciate slowly the importance of a sense of place in every wine that we try. And so when we travel the world, we look for wines that really emblem, uh, are emblematic of where they're grown and where the food that's consumed. And we've strived now for years to do several things and that's uh, be sustainable. And as I've mentioned to uh, Stuart before, we view sustainability as a three-legged stool. It's people, profit, and planet. And we, we do all three, I think, in a, in a unique way. But it's been very important to us to, in growing grapes, we, we solicit winemakers who have a respect for the sense of place that we grow. They don't 
over rot the product. They don't grow it too long. They don't make a cocktail out of it. it, it really, for better or worse, it, it, it's what you're sensing in the place. And it's really fun to try the wines. Tonight we're trying one of them, the, the Decor Shy uh, 2018, and to taste not that the wines are similar because they're not. Every winemaker, you, as you know, has their personal touch. But to, to get the hints of things, like for me, violets is something that is we can taste throughout the different winemakers. Yeah. And so it's fun to go, yeah, that's it. Here it is. Yeah, that, so that, 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 the, the violets, Betsy, that's kind of the signal of, the, of, of, of place. That's the sense of place in every bottle kind of thing. It's for me, anyway. It's one, it's so one cool. of those that I, I can uh, tell, especially when it's young. Oh, it's really nice. So, yeah, I think that that's what we're happy about, is that we try our, our hardest to um, give back to the land, give, give it everything, take good care of it, take good care of the plants. Um, be as, uh, we, we farm as carefully as we can. And, uh, and then to have people who... Um, acknowledge that and are aware of that the, this is from this spot and to bring out the highlights of what this grapes in this property have to offer so that's if, that's if we if we could take a little bit bigger picture of the property because you have the vineyard but you also kind of look at the property itself as three different sections and, and so when you're kind of talking about sustainability can you kind of talk about like the hillsides kind of moving up into i guess towards Veter, I guess, Mount Veter, and then uh, this area, and then down into the vineyard. Sure. Yeah, well, we have, uh, we have uh, 57 acres that is, is the shape of a long rectangle, and the, um, the short end is on Dry Creek Road, and then it goes back up into the hills. So we're about 300 feet off the vineyard floor, and at the top of the hills is probably more like, I don't know, 400, 500. 500. And, um, that, and then that tip is in the Mount Veter Appalachian. But what's been lovely about this is, is as you know, the, the, the lower part is more open and we've made that into the vineyards because that was the uh, most accessible part. And then as the hill would go up, um, there's open meadow and we've encouraged wildflowers. We have, um, we've in the vineyard in sectory, but up on the meadow, we have wildflowers and we've encouraged, we have bees, uh, beehives up there to, to keep everything alive and fresh. And then, and, and then we have fenced off the forested area, which is the last third of the property. And that's a place where the deer hang out, the wild turkeys, the coyotes. Um, uh, it, it's, we just leave it be, we tend to it. And we, should, we have a trail that goes through there that we use, but uh, it's just left alone. So uh, we've got only one third of the property that's developed into grapes. Yep. So we're moving, here we are, we're like, you know, we were walking the vines yesterday. Everything is colored up. Uh, for those who don't know, we kind of call this time of year verasion. And actually we're kind of moving beyond verasion. Uh, Betsy, Steve, like, what gives you the hardest? What gives you and Roberto, and we can talk about Roberto, what are you looking for? vineyard practices are going on. Actually, I can see the uh, the shading behind you. What are you doing during this time of year? Well, right now, we uh, you can see behind us in the vineyard uh, the shade cloth that we're pulling down to protect the vines from a heat, uh, heat wave that we're going through. We're irrigating now to give the vines a little bit of protection against uh, the uh, evapotranspiration that's going to be occurring because of the wind and the heat. Um, the, the, we, we try to use uh, uh, deficit irrigation to uh, maintain or uh, exacerbate the quality of the grapes. We don't over irrigate, but uh, we're on Dry Creek Road and water is a premium here. But uh, right now um, we've gone through um, a lot of canopy management in especially this year uh, as compared to others, uh, a, a very excessive amount of canopy management to maintain the proper leaf uh, uh, assortment to grow the grapes. All of the action of the 
uh, vineyard that's gone into promoting leaf growth and shoot growth. Now with veraison, that is going to turn into sugar development in the berries. So it's been our, really fun to watch them when they first started out just yeah. green, so small, and just in a matter of weeks, as they turn color from green to purple, they've started to enlarge. So you can tell that the plant now is taking all its energy from growth. And you can tell that because the tips of the vines no longer have little baby leaves growing out of them. They're, they're almost inverted. And um, all that energy is going down to the fruit to bring in the flavors and the phenolics development that we will need uh, to have a, a really nice grape in, I don't know, 40, 50 days. Yeah, yeah. and one of the things you can look for, uh, a signal to us is lignification. Mm -hmm. That lignification is a way of saying we're watching the, the shoots turn from green to kind of brown. And the, that first occurs on the shoots. Uh, secondarily, it occurs on the rachis, the little thing that holds the cluster together. Okay. And the tertiary, tertiary recognition of that is the seed coloring. And the seed coloring is what the winemakers look for when they're coming to figure out when it's time to harvest. And when the seeds turn brown, that's the first clue. Now, when the skins start to exude color on themselves, that's another clue, but that's one of many. And to my, uh, our amazement, um, as we've walked the vineyard the last two, three days, uh, we're finding more and more seeds are already turning brown, which is very early for us. Uh, we, you know, we don't expect to harvest until mid-September uh, at the beginning, that's Cab Franc. Um, but uh, to see this happening already is uh, unique. Uh, so. It, you know, as we say in farming, nature deals the cards, we play the hand. <laughs> very, very nice. We do have a question and from Mark. Mark. Mark is very concerned. Why isn't the chicken wearing a mask? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, she keeps her head down. <laughs> we, need to, we need to get a, a Mold's family vineyard mask for that chicken. <laughs> it was very small. Hey, you talk about precision. We, we often talk about precision viticulture, but uh, I'm going to say that this property uh, goes to a completely different level of precision viticulture. And Steve uh, Molds, you kind of referred to this briefly earlier. So what they have is uh, they have shoots, which go up, but then you actually, you do leaf counts for each of the shoots that are going up to, to kind of really get what you feel is di dialed in the proper photosynthesis ratio or the energy creation to get that ripeness in the fruit. Absolutely. We, we, uh, we believe that it's important uh, that we try to avoid pyrazines in the, in the flavor, the green flavors, the jalapeno, the pepper flavors. Uh, so we, we look at the leaves as the factory of photosynthesis that provides that growth and later the sugars. Um, so we we usually do a leaf count of 12 to 16 leaves, depending on leaf size. Uh, the basil leaves being the largest usually. And this year, because of the drought, some of the leaves have not gotten very large size. So we'll we'll tend to have more leaves perhaps in certain areas. And uh, uh, other, in other areas, we've cut off the laterals a little bit and, and left a couple of the basil leaves to provide more photosynthesis um, and more shading necessarily in the fruit zone. That's getting in the weeds. Um, I think uh, what, what we look for is, is balance. Um, and um, we, the leaves do many things besides being the factory. They also um, help to protect the fruit from the sun. And so in our vertical shoot positioning, which means that they go upright, yeah, we're in the south end of the valley, and so we have a little bit of wind to deal with, and sometimes all those little vertical shoots will want to fall over, which means that a lot of the grapes can be under a heavy, dense leaf coverage with shade. So we uh, go the extra step, and we have what we call kiwi clips, little clips that hold the shoots upright. If you can imagine, and I, I don't remember how many hundreds of thousands of clips. We have, we have 800,000 yeah. kiwi clips. Yeah, it takes a long time to put them up. <laughs> but they hold those little shoots upright, and so we know we have a balance of sun and shade 
on the fruit below, and it's going to get what it needs uh, to really get those delicious flavors. And I, and I would add to that that the wind would knock over the shoots, and thereby we would not be able to count the number of leaves. So we yeah, realized sometimes really they get really long. that we needed to have them remain vertical so we could maintain control of the leaves that were the factory of photosynthesis that uh, we needed. So that's proved expensive, but uh, uh, very popular with our wine and wineries. Exactly, the winemakers really appreciate it. There's yeah, a, so there's a couple. For those of you, so Old Stanley Vineyard, while it's not a, you know, it's not a Beckstoffer name or stagecoach, you know, that people are familiar with, everybody in Napa knows Steve and Betsy because they've been on the forefront of a, of a number of initiatives that we'll talk about later. Uh, 2018, they were named Great Brewer of the Year. I think it was 2018, is that right? Uh, Great yeah. Brewer of the Year. And, um, and, and because the property is, is somewhat small, you know, the, the, where you'll find these wines are from uh, Dakota Shy, uh, a wine that I haven't tasted yet, but I keep hearing crazy things that I need to, yeah, see? Stu got the good assignment today. <laughs> He got to go to the property and he's drinking a wine that I've been itching to try for about a year and a half. Um, sorry, not sorry is what he's saying right there. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, also Barron's uh, family and, um, and then I know Roy Piper Cellar. Right. Piper Cellar. Um, he, does, he does a little bit of a blend with it and uh, I don't know, I'm missing one or two, but they're, they're all highly sought after, normally very allocated bottles um, and so there's not, in the grand scheme of things, there's not that much fruit. So it's really, we're incredibly kind of awestruck that we actually have the ability to, we're going to be adding this into um, our vineyard options this year. It's going to go very, very quickly. If you are interested in it, reach out to Stuart. We have not put it in the guide yet. Um, but it is, you, you get a sense here from, from Betsy and Steve about how meticulous they are about farming. And it's no joke. Stu came back from the vineyard the other day and said, Steve, I swear there are literally 15 leaves on every, <laughs> every can. <laughs> so, um, and, and, and I was like, really? You're, you're exaggerating. He's like, I'm not exaggerating. And then Steve just backed it up <laughs> with, with that philosophy. So, and, and you guys have a gentleman named Roberto um, who is kind of running the, yeah. the, the farm, yeah? Yes, so, Roberto. He, he sounds like a pretty, pretty special individual who also works extremely hard. This is really, it's not our ranch. This is Roberto's ranch. We don't pay him a salary, we pay him rent to live here. He, he's very proprietary about everything and he comes up with so many ideas uh, of how to improve what we're doing. And we, you know, teeny synopsis, we met him because we asked our gardener if he knew anybody that wanted some extra hours. And we just saw in him uh, that desire to learn and do well and to learn more and now 10 12 years later he's our ranch manager uh, he's taken advantage of the napa valley grape growers courses and the farm worker foundation courses and he's he's just consistently kept up and he always wants to so he's been a great partner he'll come and tell us you know on row 35 vine 10 there's vine mealybug <laughs> So it's one plant where it's out, we clean it up, and that's it. He's so attentive. He's fabulous. He's a, he's a nice looking young man, too. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at him here on, on the yeah. oldfamilyvineyard.com website here. And uh, I mean, he's, he's, a, he's a nice looking, handsome man. He's a he great guy. And as Bessie says, he, he has learned with us. We, we had him as a part time uh, helper here for a couple of years, and we realized his his earnest, his history in um, farming from Mexico and his passion for the land. And we thought we should capitalize this. And we sent him to work with our vineyard manager at the time who kept him as an intern for a year and uh, tried to hire him away from us, obviously. But <laughs> he came back and took over vineyard management um, for the management company. And now we're just, we manage it ourselves. And Roberto does everything from hiring, training, uh, the protocols for COVID, uh, all that he translates, helps us translate into Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, it's just his capacity for work and ownership of this ranch is legion. Uh, yep. just, he's and, you know, he's, we have 
gardens here, thanks to him, the fresh tomatoes. Uh, he's added more chickens to the chicken stock so that we have plenty of eggs and uh, his kids love coming here and being participating in it. So it's really a wonderful family feeling, really wonderful. It is. Well, and, and obviously all of that effort and love, and I, I mean, that's the first, the first leg on the stool was people, I, I think you, you'd said. So mm -hmm. it, it shows right there and it comes through in the fruit. So for those of you on here that are not familiar with uh, the vineyard itself and, and how um, incredibly special it is, uh, all of those wines that I've mentioned consistently score, you know, 95 to 99 points easily. I, maybe there's a hundred in there. I don't know. I don't want to misspeak, but, um, but they are, are, are really special, uh, small, small bottlings and allocated, allocated wines. And so obviously the work that Roberto puts in there, he's actually on here. Uh, I, I see his name on, on the, uh, on the Zoom here, so um, so. Cheers, Roberto. Roberto. Cheers, Roberto. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as as you get a sense here, I'm I'm gonna shift. We, Betsy talked a little bit about Verizon and and how that happens, and so and Stu mentioned earlier in the beginning part of the program that we um, we're out in some vineyards today, and so right now as as the winemaking community is kind of preparing for harvest, there's a lot of different things that are happening at the winery. We're starting to really get the tanks prepped and ready. We're checking our glycol levels. We're, you know, that's the less sexy side of, of, of the stuff. The more sexy side of the stuff is, um, Stu and I were out in the vineyards today checking on our Sauvignon Blanc for Patrick, who um, was over in Sonoma doing a few other things. So um, we do have a little bit to talk about sampling. And there are a few different ways that people sample. And it all kind of fosters on the, you know, Steve really talked to, Steve Moulds really talked about, um, oh, I guess that's easier. I don't talk about myself in the third person. So <laughs> Steve was talking about, um, you know, how meticulous they are about their farming. And, um, and it's really a special thing to be able to have that. So you can get into the same thing about sampling, Stu. There's a few different styles here. You know, I know what we do, but you, you want to talk a little bit about um, the differences? Yeah. yeah, so different people will, so we kind of talked about the precision viticulture here and every, every vineyard and every winery have their own philosophy. And what we'll, what we'll show video of how Steve, Patrick and, and our crew, uh, how we kind of pull our samples, but other people might do berry sampling where they kind of taste, taste small little pieces from around the vineyard. Um, and they might use a tool in the vineyard called a refractometer just to get a little bird's eye view or maybe, but I'm going to say that's kind of more of a, a Mac, uh, like a micro eye view. The challenge with that, with, with berry sampling is that if you have acres or if you have different blocks or if there's elevation changes in a particular block of fruit, you have a very small piece of data. And if you're trying to extrapolate a larger picture, if you just take a few berries, you might miss the boat. So Steve, do you wanna pull a video of where we were at today? And we, you'll see that Steve and I and Patrick, we have a slightly different approach when we're kind of pulling samples just to make sure we're gonna get the right picture of what we're tasting and seeing. Absolutely. I'm gonna, uh, so this is the part of the technology bits that I get a little nervous, so. And I'll continue to talk. So yeah, when that, we drive that, uh, out to the vineyard, uh, <laughs> what I do, we have a couple of Ziploc baggies and we clean our, we clean our clippers so we make sure we don't uh, allow a vector for, for disease to impact the vine. Um, All right, ready? Here we go. I think we're here. Greetings. Today we're talking about sampling. Now, different wineries do different approaches when they're sampling grapes to try to figure out what is the flavor, what are the sugar levels right now. We do it a, uh, kind of a random cluster sampling. Look, these rows are long, so it's our job to try to extrapolate a lot of data into a small area. So I kind of do random sampling. I look, kind of walk down the rows a little bit, kind of get an idea of what I'm seeing, pop it in there. Kind of walk 
over to on the, this is the morning side of the canopy. Now I want to come on over to like the afternoon side of the canopy where these grapes are going to get a little more sun and pop that in. And we'll continue to do this. We're going to fill up this, uh, this bag from this block. We also have another block here at this vineyard. We'll fill that up, bring it back to the winery, smash up these grapes, taste the juice, uh, and then also run lab analysis on it. So that's just kind of sampling 101. So, to, to just fill in here as I uh, continue to play with my technology, um, the lab analysis there um, ended up coming in, I think it was a blended average of about 20.8 bricks and 10.2-ish TA. Um, we got some messages here, I'm just making sure. Oh, yeah. Roberto hey. done. I just wanted to make sure Patrick wasn't going to correct me, but that's that's what I saw on there. Um, Stu, is that about right? Yeah. So for for that particular property, so that's not Mold's family vineyard. It, it's farm. That property is farmed a very different way. It's a Sauvignon Blanc site, and they believe in something called a splay trellising. So um, so it's trellising is kind of a figurative term there. It's more of kind of an interpretive dance. So it's not like a perfectly even fruiting zone, but they've been farming there for a hundred years. The family has for over a hundred years. And so they, that's their, that's kind of their philosophy. And uh, so it, in terms of grabbing grape samples, a little more challenging because this part of the canopy might be a little more ripe up here with a little more shading might have a little bit higher acid. So we're trying to take that all into consideration so that we can make more accurate decisions. But with those numbers that Steve just tossed out, just over 20 degrees bricks, most people equate it to sugars. It's mostly right. And then something called the titratable or total acidity, which is over 10. Um, it just to let, translate that for people, that's very, very bright. But we're going to see that TA come down and we're going to see the pH, which is at around 2.8, which is very, very bright acid. That's going to start coming up. So sugars are going to come up. Acids are going to come down, but we're only a couple of weeks, it, especially when Steve Molds alluded to a heat spike. It's going to be our first one of the season. And he said that he was going to irrigate a little bit as a kind of a preemptive strike to help his canopy, help those grapes make it through this next couple of days without getting too much stress. So it's a dance. We try to stress them out a little bit, but we don't want the vine to get shocked and start crashing this early in the season. So Stu, while we're on the topic, I'm gonna just um, jump to, I've got two other just sort of, you know, 101 kind of videos here for folks of sure. uh, what happens after we sample. So um, if, you, if you don't mind, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play those and they're just like 30 seconds each. You good with that? Absolutely, and I think it's gonna have a very handsome actor right there. All right, here we go. Let's see here. Hey, we're back from the vineyard and we were pulling from two different blocks. So we separate the samples so that the data from that one block is gonna be distinct. So we really know what's happening in the individual sections of the vineyard. The clusters are in here. And then I'm just gonna smush up these grapes. We'll have juice after I smush them up we're gonna put that in the centrifuge because there's a lot of heavy uh, material in there. We wanna separate that out. And then we're gonna run the first numbers of the year. Wow, wearing the mask. Uh, nothing more inspiring than that. Whoops, sorry, I'm screwing up here. Go in here, sorry about this. We're having technical difficulties, I think. There we go. I think we call that, we call that user error. Yeah, and now we're going to introduce our friend, Connor. Hey everyone, this is our first juice sample of the year. We are about to run it under the FOSS to get all the analysis, which will include our bricks, TA, assimilable nitrogen, and our mouth. Yeah, so we're going to look at the glue fruit, we're going to look at the glu uh, glucose, all, basically all your simple sugars. And here it is. 
first juice sample of the year. And Connor, how long will this take? 30 seconds. Very, very quick. Easy. Hey, and you'll, these numbers that you see in your inbox right now, these are the numbers we just pulled up. Cheers, right. everybody. So, Thanks, Connor. Good thing that wasn't Connor's debut, because I think, I, I think he's got so much more personality than we allowed him to come through with there. But, um, but yeah, so that's sampling, really, at the end of the day. And so that's what we do a lot of coming up here. By the time we get to the Cabernet and, and talking about Mold's Family Vineyard, you know, we're, we're not going to get to the point of sampling for, for a little bit. And also, I don't want anybody to misunderstand that sampling is, or those numbers that we got from the lab, is a component. Um, but really, the overriding component is the winemaker's palate and the, and the phenolics on it. And so... You can, you can manipulate sugar in the wine, you can ma manipulate um, pH and, and TA that Connor referenced, it's called either tartaric acid or titratable acidity. Um, they're kind of in interchangeable, but basically it, it's a measure of acid. Um, and so, and, and as, as the sugars rise, the acid's gonna drop. And so it's a delicate balance. But numbers are really only part of the story, and I wouldn't say they're more than maybe 30% of the story. Um, if you're making a very high-end wine, your winemaker needs to understand the phenolic compounds of the grapes, because that is the one thing you are not able to manipulate in the winery. Um, and that is what makes things very special, and that's what makes the ability to work with growers like Betsy and Steve um, very special. Same thing with working with, you know, vineyards like George III or Stagecoach or Melrose Vineyard, you know, all, all of these things. These are growers that under, understand all of this and, and give the winemakers the flexibility and the freedom to call those picks accordingly. Because what, you know, what block one, one person might have, one of the buyers of, of a block from Mold's family, their block might be ready to go based on what their style is, but the block of buyer B may not be ready to go. And so, um, that that's what happens in the ultra premium market, and um, and so yeah. Anyway, that's 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 uh, more wine business one hundred and one, I guess, a little bit. But. Steve, can I pile in with one more thing? Please. So when you, when like when you kind of have those numbers, I often equate it to when a child learns how to use a comma or quotation marks. When when somebody is exposed to bricks or total acidity or pH levels. Some people kind of overcompensate. They kind of jump on these numbers and like it has to be this way. And uh, just like a kid, when you teach them how to use a comma, the first few sentences will be like, I ran up the street, you know, comma, comma, comma. Uh, and it's because they are they're They've learned how to use a new tool. And so even though I'm going to be sharing numbers to you in chemistry, don't kind of overread into it because it ultimately boils down to something that Betsy and Steve said before, which is balance and flavor, right? So we've, we've, we're going to be making our decisions based on those things. So I'd, we've got some questions for Steve and Betsy, if that's okay. Do you mind if we shift? Okay. Um, so Mark asks, uh, and this is the same one that was concerned about the chicken and, and the mask. Um, so you know, but we'll see, but he's got some good words in this one that I can see. Apart from the onus of certification, given your meticulous attention to holistic agriculture, as well as sustainability, how do you veer, if you do, from biodynamic farming? Uh, I would say we appreciate many of the basics of biodynamics, and we try to incorporate those things that fall within our uh, attempt to be organic farming in style. Um, but we have carefully measured the trade-offs between pure sustainability, which we aspire to and have been recognized for, but uh, the multiple passes required to farm organically um, don't necessarily compensate for the improvements that we uh, somehow we we, we farm organically up until a certain point. And then at that point, um, the multiple passes with the tractor 
uh, the CO2, all of that. We, use of gas. We use of gas. We, we try and measure, moderate things as much as possible. So we, we walk a middle line where we incorporate the best practices we can from all uh, the uh, available uh, so, so we have um, we have insect trees, which um, are every other vine row, and and those encourage pollinators and our um, predators for the pests that we find in the vineyard. They they are home to those uh, bugs as well. We have birdhouses that um, encourage bluebirds, kestrels, hawks, owls to yeah. be on property. Bad houses. Yeah, we have a bat house as well. Uh, so, so we are trying to keep everything as close to done by nature. We use a, a gramagna, which is sort of a sunflower thing that helps to remove weeds under the vine row. So we don't use, we don't use pesticides for, or herbicides for that. Um, we use a lot of shoveling, well, we, et cetera. We, 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 we believe in no-till. Uh, <laughs> We are mandated on the hillside. Uh, we have very volcanic soils on the hillside, and we are mandated on a no-till basis there. But we, we carry that over because we believe in soil structure as being imperative for the quality that we're, we aspire to. So we don't till unless we actually need to for some reason on the level mm -hmm. blocks that we have. And I would point out that we have you know, uh, 57 acres as Betsy mentioned, but we have 11 different blocks uh, in this vineyard of maybe 10 acres of vines. And uh, the important thing to know is that every one of those blocks um, is a different combination of rootstock and scion or, or clone. And that gives multiple opportunities to winemakers to you see what, what the difference is on the aspect, the, the terroir, the, the, the different soil characteristics, the amount of uh, shale, the uh, lens of uh, rocks. Uh, there's so many different characteristics on this site alone, which is yeah. for, for 11 acres of vines, that's a fairly small area. And yet we incorporate uh, hillside blocks and we uh, require, we replanted with new trellising um, to sort of get the most we can out of our site. And I would I'll just go on a second and point out with this is one cluster that we've got from well, this we just picked uh, two days ago from uh, reservoir block and this is a uh, clone 338 on 110r rootstock and you can see the extent and this on the other hand is a newly re so this is a newly re replanted block this is 169 is the clone and it's uh, planted on 1616 rootstock it, it, we, this is an exciting aspect for us. We, we, we begin <laughs> to you know, they compare rootstocks and what they can do so they're, in, they're very in, in combination, <laughs> in combination with uh, our our scions. Um, so it's and we're not a monoculture because of, of the acreage and because that we maintain so much of the natural. Not to mention the chickens that follow up Stuart around. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> very popular. Actually, we actually had a question about blocks. So, uh, you know, somebody's uh, Sarah in Menlo Park, I believe, or somewhere in the South Bay. Uh, she said how, you know, different vineyards have different tastes, right? We understand that. But are there really discernible differences, let's say even outside of the visual cues that you just spotlighted between blocks within the vineyard? You said you have 11 blocks on the property. Are there really differences within a specific site? Well, absolutely yeah i mean first the classic one is clonal differences some of the blocks are differentiated by what clones we use and the rootstock that that is uh the clones are grafted onto they pertain to the type of soil in that block so we have four acres that are relatively flat but those were very wet when we first got here there was a lot of water in those and so uh, and the soil is very vigorous. So the rootstock is actually a devigorating rootstock. And it's a shallow rootstock. It doesn't need to go down very far for water. So it gets it more on the surface. So those are uh, two ways. Uh, through the clones and the rootstocks, they differentiate certain blocks. I would say also that, uh, as Betsy pointed out with our first harvest in 2003, 
Uh, we take the vines through high school and we deliver them to you to take them to college. So we are very, we've grown to be very attentive to the people to whom we sell our fruit because they have different levels of appreciation for the fruit. Um, and I guess the important thing I would note on this topic is that um, we can control the rootstock and the, the scion. Um, we also control with the different aspects of our property, right. mm -hmm. the terroir that we offer. And interestingly enough, one of our clients, uh, actually, Baron's family, realized at some point that they had 169 planted right next to the 168 or the 338. And uh, everything was the same. The aspect was the same. The uh, soils were the same. Every single thing was the same. And they'd even done the same barrel regimen mm -hmm. in producing it. And they got to bottling and they said, wow, we've got a unique opportunity here. So they bottled it as a two bottle package. And you could, that was the one time you could see the difference between the only difference was the clone. And that was a unique mm -hmm. opportunity for people to see where every variable was absolutely the same except for the clone. And it's, it's not only unique, but when I get, when we have people over and we sit at the bench down there in the vineyard and then underneath the Buckeye tree, and we'll, we'll try there at the bottom of both blocks. We'll try a little bit of each. And then at the end, I say, well, now might become a winemaker, blend them. <laughs> <laughs> it's always better. <laughs> it always. But you know, it's, it, that, that's a, a really interesting point though, because clonal difference, you, you, at least I associate it most impactfully with Pinot Noir. I don't, I don't think about Cabernet, Cabernet Sauvignon as having, or any, any Cabernet, Cabernet Franc as well, bless you. But I don't think of, of um, I, I don't, I, I, it's probably my own ignorance that I don't really get the, the clonal difference as much. I think it's, I think it's wine culture because, you know, like it, uh, the Pinot people kind of were pounced on it and were very vocal about it. Um, so I think it's just how there's different aspects of wine culture, but it's absolutely there for Cab Sauv. And there's also, but yeah, it, there's just also a lot more going on with the Cabernet too. So, so I think to have two blocks right next to each other, three, three, eight, and the, and the one, six, nine, that would be fascinating. I, I'm, I'm going to come sit on that bench under the Buckeye tree. <laughs> okay, you're on. <laughs> we're going to, we're going to, we're going to try some. I just want um, to add a couple more. Go, go ahead, please. About, about the terroir. Um, there's, as Steve mentioned, aspect too. Um, the way you line your rows up depends, you know, if the sun hits one side more than the other. Um, when you saw the shade cloth, we have morning sun for a lot longer than we have afternoon sun. Just turned out for us, it was more economical to lay out the rows in that situation and deal with that. Um, but one of the blocks is, has equal on both sides, uh, the same amount of sun. So that, that is a different uh, part of where you have blocks. It, it gives it a totally di a different uh, aspect to the sun. And then lastly, we noticed that as we, you know, the soil isn't the same everywhere. We have two different types of soil that the uh, hillside has pagan loam, loam and the flatter area has hair loam with a little more clay. Uh, so there's different growing. You, you, you might water one area less and another area more. And then the last are gravel lenses where water might go right through. So within our vineyard, if we're on a hillside and look down, there's some areas that you can see that are actually less vigorous from the surrounding vines in the same block because of a, a lens that's just part of it. So even though it looks like the same property, there's lots of things going on in the soil. I would add to that that when you live on Dry Creek Road, water holding capacity of your soils is a very important issue. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How did they get the name of the street, right? How did they get the name of the road? So, we had to drill nine wells in order to get water is the first indication. So, so the, um, getting back to the, the three legs of the stool a little bit, um, which I think applies to, a, a lot of what you've incorporated in your lives. Um, I was hoping maybe you could tell us a little bit uh, 
more about, I, I know you're very active with uh, farm workers in, in, in the Valley. And if you could tell us a little bit about what your, what your work is and, and how that's concentrated and, and what the efforts are that you're doing there. Well, thank you for that. I, I, I think uh, Betsy and I are, are pivotably, uh, are a pivot point for us both in our lives because having served in the Peace Corps back uh, years ago, and we've carried with us that appreciation for Latin culture. Um, and it, it was one of the driving forces that came, brought us to Napa to uh, follow our bliss in terms of growing grapes and becoming, going back to farming. But uh, one of the things that's been most important for us is to have an inclusive um, attitude about the people who do this highly valued work in our vineyards. And we want to elevate their appreciation uh, and certainly do all we can to give them the skills, the professional development, the education, and the language training to be able to represent to their employers that they it should be recognized, both, both income and recognition and their status in the wineries, in the wine institute. Um, and I, that's been sort of a driving passion for us. I'm, I'm honored to be the president of the Farm Worker Foundation at the Napa Valley Group Grape Growers. And uh, that it's something that is very important to us uh, in trying to provide some semblance of a model for how best to include your workforce in your family and your operation and uh, provide them opportunities for professional development and the education they need to develop for their families. Um, so it, it's very it, enthusiastically supportive. Yes. I mean, the numbers have shown over time that their courses are always full, whether it's, you know, um, getting your uh, pesticide accreditation to driving forklifts to um, managerial techniques. They really go the basics of computer literacy and, of course, English. And Roberto is... Um with us and uh, he's attended every course that's been offered by the Great Growers and the Farm Worker Foundation, extending to leadership and uh, such that has been an important aspect of his becoming not just a, a very highly valued vineyard worker here, mm -hmm. but extending to ranch man vineyard manager, now ranch manager, hiring and training um, on the go. So and he's also now participating in teaching some of these courses at the Farm Worker Foundation because yeah. he's yeah, I mean, he did an amazing one on uh, burning. I mean, yeah. if you will, uh, there are sometimes when you rogue out disease plants, you can't recycle them back. Uh, you need to get rid of that. And so burning without smoke is, it's a talent. And, but it's something that everybody can do. There's a step-by-step -step process. And Roberto has been teaching that course, uh, one of the courses that he has taught, uh, yeah. which has been fabulous. Where, where do they, I mean, obviously, present day aside, where do they normally teach the courses and how would one go to learn more about it? They'll be at a variety of mm -hmm. uh, uh, vineyards throughout the valley as well as uh, the, uh, um, the fairgrounds. Uh, we have an annual rootstock, it's called, rootstock, where there's yeah. lots of classes, days upon days, and then there's workshops throughout the throughout the year at various vineyards or locations. Uh, for, Steve and I took the forklift driving one not too long ago. <laughs> Yay, that was really fun. Uh, the, it's, <laughs> it's fun, the, for, the forklift is, uh, there's a, I, I definitely have learned my limitations on a forklift. I, I'm, I'm not, uh, <laughs> have to be I, I try to stay it's away. <laughs> it, it does help you yeah. <laughs> at harvest. But hey, if, if I, I just, I'm, if I could pivot quickly, because we are, we are un, unfortunately a very limited time. Okay. And, and, and the only, I, I just want to like, here we are perched in Oak Knoll. Uh, I am facing out over the valley. Um, what is the Oak Knoll district of Napa Valley? I mean, what makes it special? How, do, what, how is it different than other uh, other AVAs, other growing regions within, within Napa. Let me say very quickly that uh, we, we bought this property in 1998 and we promptly had it assessed for what varietals could grow here. And uh, we leaned toward Cabernet and they said, well, 
you know, this is kind of far south for the Cabernet. You, you probably ought to consider like everybody else, Pinot Noir or Chardonnay or something. You know, if you plant Cabernet, you might ripen it, you know, you know, maybe 5% of the time you won't ripen the crop. So, you know, you got some danger there. We said, yeah, well, we'll take that risk. And uh, what's turned out and what we fought for for 10 years with Janet Trefethen and the rest of the people here to get the designation of OKD was that we have a longer hang time here. We, we have the benefit of the cooling temperatures brought in from Bay uh, and night that shut off the growing that occurs almost nonstop in Calistoga or Singalina. But uh, we have great temperatures. It's not as cold as Carneros. Um, so we've, we've turned out to be the sweet spot of Cabernet here. And, and actually it's a sweet spot, a sweet spot for all varietals because yeah. we grow more varietals here in Oak Knoll than we do any other sub ADA. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really turned into a, a wonderful location for us. And, and being on the, the base of Mount Veeder gives us more soil differentiation than most. So we're, we're blessed even in OKD to have some special characteristics here of alluvial soils and uh, uh, volcanics. Very well put, because and just if you look at if you pull up a map of AVA, if you pull up a map of Napa Valley at your house, or you're looking at it, you'll see that the Oak Knoll district is perched a little bit further south. And so you get the proximity of the bay to a few miles to the south and you get that marine influence. Uh, but you're also kind of just north of that. So you do get the ripening. And you, so with that, that push pull from the bay, you do get a very, very long hang time. And with that, flavor development. Yeah, we're sort of we're in between Napa itself, just north of Napa, just south of the Yonville Appalachian. Uh, we're just west of Stag's Leap and the Atlas Peak area. As we butt up to Silverado Trail on that side and come all the way across the valley. The only hillside property is on this side, on the west, that comes up um, to, to Mount Veeder Appalachian. We think we're the Oak Knoll Bench. Yeah, we call ourselves the Oak Knoll Bench. <laughs> Yeah. So that, that's interesting, actually. We had a question a little bit ago from uh, Tammy Frazier, and she said, uh, you often meant, and maybe this is a little bit more for Stu, but I'd rather, I'd rather Steve and Betsy mention, or answer it. Yeah. You often mentioned the benchlands. Is there a specific region or designation for benchlands in the Napa Valley? I don't think so. I think a Rutherford bench was the... Uh, the first to characterize that, and that goes back to probably Andre Chelichev, who uh, mm -hmm. brought Cabernet into uh, a, he, at uh, the uh, winery. He, it's now, uh, well, he, he was working with John Daniel, uh, and uh, he told John, you had to, you had to take out all this Pinot Noir you have planted here. We got to plant Cabernet here. So they, they did that, and uh, John Daniel called his friend at uh, John Gantner and said, you want to take these, you know, these cuttings I have, turn out to be the only surviving DRC cuttings <laughs> that were planted in the U.S. And they're now at Schoolhouse Winery up on some Spring Mountain. But, <laughs> uh, sorry. but if you think, if you look at the valley itself, um, really the, there's hillsides on either side, of course, but the, uh, the ones that are on the west side are very different. There's trees on this side. There's um, and on the east side, there's a, it's a lot more rocky, dry, and hot. And here, it's a little bit. Uh, it cools a little bit more. So I think that this side is considered the bench side of the valley. You've got Rutherford and Oakville and and uh, and Oak Knoll. Oak Knoll. And we have <laughs> and Oak Knoll. we have the volcanic it's, hillside. Um, yeah, it's just 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 enough above that it gives you a little more uh, stress on the vines because the water tends to flow down. Not as much frost problem because also the frost flows down to the valley floor. Yep. So there so are different. Betsy, would you say that maybe it's a little bit country and a little bit rock and roll? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> now you're singing her song. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, oh, no, that's great, Stu. Nice. Love, that's less yeah. That's so we're just we're just kind of put perched off. I don't know if you can. It's kind of being washed out. But on the other no, side of the see it great. Okay, so on the other side of the uh, valley, you can see the um, the Vaca Range. We're we're kind of we're at the, we're on the Mayacamus side, but we're perched above the valley floor. So this is 
bench splints. You're sitting on a bench above the valley floor. So, I, and I gotta say, so for anybody, I, I know usually we keep this to an hour, but um, if anybody needs to drop off, please feel free to do so. We know especially those on the East Coast may be a little late for you. You will not insult us, um, but I would like to uh, just say a few things and then we'll, we'll, we'll stay on if, if Steve and Betsy will let us, we'll stay on answer some questions if anybody has uh, some things maybe they didn't want to answer, ask live or anything like that, or we can just keep chatting because I, I really enjoy this. But I, I've got to tell you that um, this property for us, for the Wine Foundry, you know, we started our company in 2012. And uh, this has always been a property on our radar. And it was, as, you know, every year is just kind of ungettable. And um, we've now we've now come to a point where we are able to to be able to offer it to some of our clients and to be able to share it with with uh, share all of the passion that Steve and Betsy um, and Roberto and Hayden and Reed and, and Nick, everybody and the grandkids um, can put into the property. Um, it's an extremely special uh, place. And I think it, I think I think if you've been watching this, you understand that um, it was I, I've never been more excited for us to add a property to our catalog seriously. So and we'll probably only have maybe four or so, uh, maybe five, depends on the yield, four or five barrels of it. So if you're interested, talk to Stu. If you wanted to see what the fruit can do, um, check out Relic, check out Roy Piper Cellars, check out Dakota Shy, check out Barron's Family. Um, and uh, those, are, those are the ones, especially consistently vintage over vintage. Um, and, uh, and then you can reach out to us at makewine at thewinefoundry.com uh, for any questions. I know we got a, a, a couple of folks here um, they were asking if we're around this weekend. We are. Um, and, uh, and just a formal thank you to Steve and Betsy for taking time. And, um, and, and this is great. I mean, this is really, this is salt of the earth, why we do what we do. Um, I love the stool analogy and, and the three legs of the stool. I'm going to steal that from you. I'm going to use it probably in my day to day. Um, uh, and, and just my day to day of, of getting up in the morning. So, uh, thank you guys so much. This has been terrific. And um, we're, we'll stop the recording here in a second, but we'll stay on for a few minutes if anybody wants to, um, to chat a little bit more. And, uh, and, and thank you all so much. And cheers. Well, my glasses is almost empty. We're very happy to be cheers, here. Cheers, everybody. I would say that I would go back to what you said about family. Um, you are our first choice um, in bringing in the company because you are family to us as well. So yeah. thank you. Cheers. 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 Thanks, Thanks Betsy. Thanks, Steve. Cheers. Yeah.